Thank you, Val, and thank you, everyone. I've really gotten a lot out of this workshop so far, and being a new person in the program, I value all of your input and advice, and um, this is a nice privilege to be able to give you a little something back. Hopefully there's a, a nugget of information that you'll gain from what we have to share with you this morning. I saw our lunch today. I was like, oh, no, pasta. <laughs> I hope everybody's feeling fresh enough for a few more talks today. And then we have, <laughs> and then we have posters. So anyway, um, our, um, our site is based out of Texas A&M University, and we take students for five of the ten weeks to Costa Rica. Um, the theme of our project is, is scientifically on ecohydrology, but more in an in intellectual learning, um, I think, which is really more critical, our theme is diversity in science, interdisciplinary breadth, and global awareness. And so this is what has been the guiding principles for our program and how we do our selection. So we were asked to come and talk about um, how we reported our selection process back to NSF in our annual report. Um, what I'm going to be sharing with you is pretty much what we gave them turned into slides. Um, but we have some copies that we brought, a few of the actual report piece, um, if you're interested in seeing how that was actually formatted. Um, but anyway, we'll get started. So for this presentation, um, some of the things that, um, you know, as you're thinking about your selection process and as we were beginning this for the first time, um, it dawned on us that it's difficult to choose participants from a large applicant pool um, that will support your program goals because it's, it's really a process of narrowing that pool. Um, we want to meaningfully instill diversity in our cohort, um, but the cohort usually begins not there yet. You know, you've got a wide range of applicants, but a lot of them are not contributing to diversity or contributing to your goals necessarily. Um, also, we wanted to find ways to use technology to assist us to do a good job in this process of having such a massive amount of applications to sort through. And um, also, I want to talk about how we effectively re were able to report this back to NSF so that hopefully we can give some feedback to them and help them advance their goals. So a little quickly about my program. I've talked to a lot of you about it before. Um, five of the weeks are in Costa Rica. We only have eight total students. Um, our emphasis in our goals is to recruit from two-year community colleges. Um, we have a variety of mentors that are very interdisciplinary in nature from multiple colleges at Texas A&M University, as well as faculty and students at institutions in Costa Rica. So the themes of our program uh, are these. We want to provide them a firsthand international experience, foster a learning community, you know, basically everything. We want to do it all. Um, increase awareness of human nature inter interconnections, provide them with a cultural experience, which is different than international research experience, and then finally to demonstrate the foundational importance of diversity in science, to demonstrate that to them so that they appreciate themselves uh, the importance of diversity in the discipline. So we put together an application in Qualtrics. Thank you, Kelly, for doing most of the heavy lifting on that process. I, I don't know much about it myself, but um, we had this um, system in place from October 20th to January 20th. Um, we ask a variety of questions, just as many of you guys do. Uh, I think there's a lot in common with those. Um, demographics, their academics, their personal attributes. Um, we probably have a bit more that we ask than a lot of other programs might. It's actually pretty involved. Um, we ask them questions that relate their trajectory to the program's impact on them. Um, and then when we ask for references, we, we ask them to tell us two references and their contact information, and then we had a separate online system in Qualtrics um, to notify those folks to fill in an, another survey in Qualtrics that was um, five free response questions um, and asking them specifically um, details on their ability to succeed in a field-based program. So what the, um, was their, uh, the rec their references view on that? So um, I'm going to take over here for a minute and talk about some of our process. A again, one of the lessons that we learned is that having a really good uh, technology to manage your application process can really give you a very data-rich environment that, you know, the, the theme of this eventually is writing a good report. It's science. If you do a good job of collecting data, 
and assessing your data and analyzing your data, that leads then to good reporting uh, out of what you've done. And so an example of that is that Qualtrics, which is just like SurveyMonkey, some of you may be more familiar with that. Qualtrics does things like it gives you the lat long coordinates of applicants when they hit the submit button. And you can map that. And we were already able to tell things like, you know, we have applicants who are already on international research experiences in Central America. Our program is probably not going to be a very big marginal impact on them. Um, we have an issue with geographic diversity in the United States. Again, we want as diversity and broadly defined in as many ways as we can. We have a big cluster of students kind of in the Northeast, so let's make sure that we're also pulling in students from the Western states and the Southern states and the Midwest and so on. So, you know, the, the, I'm not necessarily saying that this is the end all be all, but this is an example of if you, if you kind of focus on a data rich uh, approach to this, some of the things that you can do. Question. Yes, ma'am. Did Qualtrics provide the mapping, or was that in Google or something? Uh, this was using a, um, um, I, to be honest, I can't remember how I did it. Um, so it wasn't Qualtrics. Qualtrics gave us the coordinates. I used something else to do the oh, mapping okay. that I can't remember yeah. the name of at the present moment. OK, yeah. cool. So it, you would enter the name of the city and the state, and it would give you x, y at lat long or something? It, it actually gave us lat long. Nice. So That's really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Oh, wait. Oh, oh sorry. Just wondering if those lat long are the coordinates of the server that they applied from, or is that something that you ask of them, like their hometown coordinates, or where does the what what exactly is the latitude and longitude of? Uh, it's the the uh, from the server where they are um, logged in when they hit the submit button. So there is a, there is an issue here of interpretation, of course, and and again we you know separately we ask what is your home state, what is your home institution. For us being in Texas, we also even asked their home county in Texas if they're a Texas uh, resident and things like that. Um, so this is just sort of a preliminary indicator level of data, but it just kind of got us thinking about things. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Do they know that they're being tracked that long? Um, they didn't know, and we didn't know. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, mea culpa if we did something wrong, but we didn't realize it. Uh, so, you know, we, we got the data export from the completed um, um, surveys, and, you know, we noticed, oh, there's a field that says lat and a field that says lawn. Let's map that and see what that is. And then we're like, oh, whoa, okay. Yeah. So what if the student was on vacation to Costa Rica and then applied? So the IP address will collect from Costa Rica, and he or she may be from New York. Yeah, so we, we are ask, asking separately okay. their home location. And, and so we can tie it so, back. OK, but when you did this final exercise, you did uh, <laughs> try to match the two. We Absol never use this at all in our selection process. Just to oh, okay. inform us okay. that they were, like, what was our potential for spreading it around? Right. Yeah. yeah. I just want to make a quick comment. Um, in case you guys want to make a map like this, you can do this easily with latitude, longitude, or the home address. You can use the GIS software. There must be someone who knows GIS on your campus. It's very easy, have yeah, a GIS yeah. online. So you can uh, make yeah. map like this very right, I mean, This was some sort of a GIS utility. I just can't remember the exact name of yeah, what I used yeah. it's been so, a few months, but yeah. So I, I forgot to mention to you that this was going to be a thesis defense. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I should have known it's geo slide, you have five questions. and I put a map in front of geo scientists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so continuing on with this discussion of <laughs> the data that's obviously flawed and will never get me my PhD. <laughs> uh, again, so again, this this data rich environment that we were trying to work in. Um, just just categorizing what were the academic majors of all of our applicants and going through and saying, OK, where are we getting high clusters of a lot of applicants, and where are we getting not a lot of applicants? Because again, we're trying to develop diversity. Who are we going to target in the rest of the selection process? Um, again, uh, more utilities. So we have all these essay questions. Uh, Qualtrics will generate word clouds from all of the thousands and thousands of words uh, that you have. Um, 
again, there, there's nothing here that we're making hard decisions on. These are the eight students based on this. But it was a really nice way to kind of get an understanding of what were the sort of the, the means and medians of what people were saying when they wrote their essays. Uh, and we could go on and on. We have other questions that were, you know, things on Likert scales and stuff like that. And we could get a feeling for, you know, what does our, our applicant pool look like? And so what would be the deviations from that and that kind of thing? OK, so <coughs> what we did was we broke down the process of selection into phases. Um, our first phase was a pre-screening um, process. Um, the second phase, we actually developed a scoring rubric um, and uh, scored every applicant according to our rubric. And the third phase was to conduct web interviews. Using the same rubric, we also scored again and um, were able to assemble those data. So again, phase one, um, the decisions were made by the two of us, and we went, made them separately, and then we compared our notes so that we're like, OK, um, we think these people should be screened out. Oh, these are the same ones I thought, thought so too. And then if there were one that, that didn't agree between the two of us, we'd talk about it. Um, so the two things that we were screening for was to, um, to identify students that could receive the greatest personal impact from the program and contribute to the diversity um, in a broad way to our final cohort. Um, talking about those greatest personal impacts, I mean, we screened out seniors because we had said in our original plan we were not going to allow seniors into our program past a certain point in their program, so they were not qualified. Um, we also used NSF's guidelines on male-female balance, on people who had had former REUs, um, and of course, um, you know, following that very carefully, we were able to find several students that had applied that it did not meet those criteria. This reduced our applicant pool. Initially, we had 110 in our applicant pool, and this got us down to about 47. So then we could actually, yes, a question. Just a really quick question that may be a stupid one because I'm new. Um, how do you know that they participate in REU? If they, do they self-identify that, or is there some way to It's check? on their resume, or it's mentioned usually uh, in great detail in their essays. OK. Yeah. Um, so phase two, we really started reading through every detail. Um, and we used a structured rubric, which I brought a few copies of. We're also going to be presenting this stuff um, in a little bit more detail in a poster this afternoon if you want to hear more. But the five um, uh, scoring criteria that we used were potential impact on the student, whether they had appropriate expectations and attitudes for the program, did they understand what they were getting into, um, whether they can, uh, had any important skills or knowledge specific to this REU, and that was broadly defined. I mean, that could come in from different angles on a lot of different kinds of skill sets. Um, whether they contribute to the diversity of the cohort, again, very broadly defined. We're looking at where they're from, what their socioeconomic status is, you know, what kind of school they went to. A lot of different attributes goes into that. And finally, the academic strengths. Um, this, in this case, we were able to um, score these with as many of our mentors that were willing to volunteer to help with this process, and they, they were just asked to give us scores. So we collected these, and then the two of us went through those results together and defined our short list um, to go to the next phase for the interviews. And, and I'll interject and say GPA was not reported to anybody in the selection process. We've learned that lesson. So phase two, questions? Okay. Phase three were our interviews. We gave 20-minute inter video conference interviews um, using WebEx. And um, they were um, asked a standard script of questions. Um, we did these in teams of two to three mentors. One of us was always there um, so that there was a few different people there to interject an opinion. Um, we used the same scoring rubric as before so that everybody was actually taking notes and then going through and scoring them again. And um, the WebEx interviews were recorded for later review, and this actually became very handy because when we th had these recordings, at times we would have somebody go back and watch another one again, or maybe somebody who hadn't had a chance to see one of the others, but they saw, um, a f you know, not everybody went to all of them, of course, so they would want to see the ones they missed potentially and, and, and get a sense for why we were really excited about that applicant. Um, of course, we did ask 
the, um, the students their permission before we recorded them. Um, we were very careful to do that. Question? Yes. So in my experience of using videos for actually job applications that are not REUs, um, in general, I found them personally very useful. But in some cases, we found that we were totally wrong in how we read the, the video. For example, somebody who did not come across at all well. And you know, you're giving cutting slack for you know it's a nerve-wracking situation and so on. But maybe there are other aspects or qualities that you think not not so appropriate for or not such a good fit. But then we call them in for an interview and go, wow, this person was great. And conversely, having somebody come across well in an interview, I mean a video interview, then later, you know, turns out not to be such a good fit. Did you have, what did you find? Did you think that it was super helpful? Did you have that same experience where some were not uh, yes. a good reflection? There was, there was definitely one of the interviews that we had originally thought was going to be wonderful, and the interview didn't go so well. Right. I wasn't in on that one, if you want to come. Uh, oh, you mean the, the expectation going into the interview? Yeah, the expectation yeah. going into the interview was high, and then the, the interview itself yeah. was you know, really not what we thought it would be. And I, I would say that once we had our eight cohorts, on, our eight students in our cohort on campus, all eight of them seemed to match up pretty well with what we saw in the video interview. Uh, we'd be happy to ask for a supplement to bring um, all of our students to campus for uh, in-person <laughs> interviews, of course. Uh, that's a joke. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just, just kidding about that. It's okay. We're good at saying no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think this is pretty standard stuff, so um, we'll move on to the results. Now, again, this is exactly what we shared in our report to NSF, was basically the information that you just saw in the slides about our phases and how we did it, our rubric and how we used it, and finally, the, the results of um, how the characteristics of the applicants changed phase by phase, which I'm going to have Kelly talk about. Uh, was there a question? Or, no, I'm no sorry. it's okay. not. All right, so um, again, back to the PhD defense portion of the presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so again, this is, this is exactly what uh, we, we showed to our, our program director that um, they, they seem to really appreciate. Um, here is uh, stage by stage how many, student, oops, how many students we have uh, in each phase of review. So here's our initial pool. Here's the, after that first round of screening. Here is the short list that got interviewed, and then here's our eight students in our final cohort. Um, and then the gender balance. And so um, you know, one thing that we really, really liked about using this kind of a process, this phase kind of process, was that at every step uh, in the, the process, we had our big reality check and said, OK, here's where we are in terms of we know that we want to be at a gender balanced cohort. We're starting with 70-30. Are we moving in the right direction? And so we could see that, yeah, we are. Or, you know what, we've, we've got to adjust some things here. Maybe there's some strong students that we're leaving out, and we need to bring them back in. Um, uh, race and ethnicity, um, it, it, it looks like we're getting a little bit less diverse, um, but it, you have to remember here we're talking about just eight students. And so um, just the numbers are such that you're, you're going to wind up with a limited range. But still, um, in terms of uh, non-Caucasian students, um, we're, we're doing quite well. And actually, this is a, a prefer not to answer. This was a Hispanic student. Um, For so. those of you with bad eyesight like me, um, do you want to know the colors, what they represent? Oh. Are you interested? OK. So um, light blue is uh, white. Uh, the pink color is Hispanic Latino. And they could select more than one category. So um, it, that's, that's always an issue. Uh, the green is Asian. Uh, the yellow is African American. Uh, the red is Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander. Uh, the purple is American Indian Alaska Native. And then the brown is prefer not to answer. Um, we don't look so good right here on American Indians and um, Native Hawaiians. Uh, we looked back at this. And these were a couple of applicants who thought it would be cool to select every single category. So um, we report the data as the data comes in. But we don't have high confidence in some of those low numbers. Yes, sir. Just curious, um, any reason why you have no African Americans in your final pool? No, that's a great question. Uh, we, 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 we brought uh, two African Americans, two out of the 15, uh, into the short list. They were interviewed. And in the end, uh, when it came down to impact, uh, one student uh, that was interviewed, um, we, we were conducting the interview, and we noticed that the background behind the student is kind of unusual. And we say, that's interesting. What's going on there? And, and the student said, well, I'm, I'm actually on a study abroad in Sydney, Australia right now. Uh, and that, combined with some other factors, 
uh, when we compared that student to the other students in the, the shortlist, uh, the issue of, of potential impact just, just did not seem to be there. Uh, and the other student, uh, the other African American student, um, we, we got into the interview process and we found that really that student just did not seem to have a whole lot of um, uh, drive necessarily to go into research, that uh, he viewed this uh, opportunity more of as a, I'll get to go see a new area of the world and oh, if I have to do some research, okay. Um, and so when it just came down to the, the question of impact, um, those two students, uh, it just, just, just wasn't in, in it for them. What could you then do to make sure you have enough or more African Americans to begin with? <laughs> yes, uh, every everything Vernon said yesterday. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, you know, the big takeaways that we're learning here are to to build those relationships with minority-serving institutions. We we've got to uh, we've got to get in the car, and 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 drive uh, to institutions like Houston Community College. Uh, like uh, El Centro Community College in Dallas, just the local ones. Uh, I'm probably going to be contacting several of you who I've met here at the workshop. If you'll uh, take my phone call, uh, I'd love to talk with you about ways to uh, maybe we can swap students or, or at least get the information to them. But um, Another point to make, yeah. too, is, is that um, most of our minority-serving institutions in Texas, especially at the community college level, are, are larger Hispanic population. Um, not to say that, that there, there's particular targeting going on, but we just had higher reaching out to those institutions that um, were primarily Hispanic serving institutions. Can, can I follow up on one thing? Yeah. So this is a little bit of um, following up on Reggie's point, um, and and I, I think it's a tricky thing to to figure out, um, and, I, and I'm not trying to play too much devil's advocate really. Um, so um, the issue of like how the impact on the person, and I think what it reminds me of is, well, I guess, you know, there's socioeconomic impact and then there are other kinds of impact. And so several years ago, uh, when I was running the recess internship at UNAVCO, um, we selected that we had so few African-American male applicants, I mean, maybe one, and he was at Princeton. And so in the end, I, we, we accepted him and then some, colleagues at UNAVCO, one in particular, gave me a hard time and said, why are you doing that? He doesn't need this. And you could say socioeconomically that he didn't need it. But um, two things. One is think about what Vernon, well, I, I don't know if he said it in his talk or in a breakout that I was in, but is that um, you, you get to a wall, like if, if you're a person of color, you know, maybe you're supported through the program of undergraduate or are you or whatever, and then you graduate and then it's, uh, you know, you, ha you, you find out that, oh, the organizations you're applying to are all white or something like that and that maybe maybe socioeconomic stuff like he, as Vernon, I guess, did he say this in the talk about if you're, if you're on a, um, some situation, you can't tell your socioeconomic status, maybe it's AMS, that, that, but you can tell that you're black. And so there, there is supporting people for that reason that is not socioeconomic. And this particular student from Princeton, um, he, it did change his life, and he, it did provide him with a cohort, a diverse cohort. It was a very diverse cohort. And he talked about it, like that it, and he ended up becoming, he works in the admissions office at Princeton. So I think that there's another element which is supporting people um, to provide them with a diverse community that's not related to the socioeconomic. I do think, you know, it can be tricky, but I think that it's still valid or valuable. I just want to say that the 110 applicants, the 110, the 110 applicants are including international as well, right? They're all national? Uh, uh, citizens and permanent residents. Or oh, U.S. citizens, oh, because the first map, the Qualtrics, had many applicants who were. That's just where they happened to be at that, that day. Okay, yeah. okay. So the eight applicants, um, do you know which campus or university they were from, just to see the local we or national? Oh, yes. you have yeah. a slide. Yeah. Well, okay, we'll okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, first generation college, oops, first generation and college status again, uh, trying to improve um, and seeing how that's, that's moving through the process. Um, institution and academic program type. Uh, we started with a very heavy applicant pool, or applicant pool very heavy on students at four-year institutions. 
Uh, and you can see that you know, we really did have a, a strong emphasis on trying to bring in students from two-year institutions or two-year programs and how we increase that through the, the selection process. Um, but again, we, you know, we can be doing better and, and we take all of your, your criticisms and, and, um, and comments. They're, no, they're, 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 they're very uh, good. And then academic major, um, again, we're an interdisciplinary program, so we're paying a lot of attention to make sure that we're getting a lot of different a a academic uh, viewpoints. Um, I will point out again this, this data richness. Um, you know, one thing that we did, and I shared it with one of the, the listening groups yesterday, uh, at, at this phase, before we even had all the complete applications, uh, over the winter break, the, the Qualtrics system allows you not only to look at who has finished the application, but it allows you to see who has started an application. And so we went into the uh, started applications that had not yet been completed and found students from underrepresented groups and two-year uh, colleges and reached out to them with individual personalized emails over the winter break to say, hello, Jennifer, uh, thank you so much for starting your application. Hope everything's going well for you at uh, XYZ uh, College. Um, we see a lot of really good stuff so far in the application. We, we really want you to complete this. Let us know if there's anything that we can do to facilitate that. And we, we had about a 40 to 50% conversion rate uh, on those. So again, this, this kind of idea of this, this data-rich environment, you know, using the technology to enable things um, really helps. And I'll also say that um, we also have done recently a post-mortem on the applications that never got finished. Uh, and we looked at, um, you know, we have really here a very small number of, of applications from two-year programs. Uh, we had another, uh, I believe it was 10 applications that were started and never finished from uh, students at two-year uh, two schools that would have essentially doubled our, our pool of students from there. And 80% of those applicants were from some underrepresented group. So we have some work to do in terms of uh, continuing that idea of, OK, you, you started this. Let, what, what do we need to do to, to get you to, to complete the application? And uh, maybe we need to reach out to your faculty member and make sure that they're encouraging you and you've got plenty of resources. Yes. I just have a question about major. The, the two um, engineering majors in your final cohort, are those male or female? One was male, one was female. Okay, because the reason I'm asking is in all of our data, within ocean engineering, um, we still are way low on women. And I'm, and I'm watching this, oh, we need more men into oceanography. And it's like, no, 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 except in engineering, we've got to keep pushing for the women. And I don't want to see that slipping, so. I, I'm an engineering, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I'd like to see two women there, so anyway. Yeah. Like the Supreme Court. I, in, in my defense, actually sitting on my laptop uh, desktop right now, I have uh, the draft of her graduate research fellowship application that I'm working on with her. So, so we're going to get her in there. So final cohort, um, half and half uh, women and men. Um, so the question about where did they all come from? Uh, Texas, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Alabama, New York. So we try to get some geographic diversity in there. We did include one student from our own campus to be an ambassador and sort of help out with local logistics. Here's where you go to the grocery store and things like that. Uh, majors two in engineering, three in geosciences, three in life or eco sciences. Uh, a nice mixture in, in terms of academic progress, um, which was especially good to help scaffold uh, some of our younger students. 50% uh, uh, from underrepresented ethnicities uh, in the geosciences. Uh, a quarter from community colleges. We actually had another student who was at a, an associate's degree program, but it was a little bit different, so we don't even include him. Uh, a quarter first generation in college. 50% uh, from non-research schools. Uh, one of the student was from a, one student was from an R2 school, and then, and then three of the eight were from R1 schools. So trying to, to, to get to that outreach to non-research schools. So uh, overall lessons that we've learned so far, this phase process, it really is a, is a fantastic way to make sure that as you move through the screening process, you're meeting their, your goals. It, it forces you to stop and look and, and say, you know, how are we really doing here? Um, I, I've talked a lot about this, but the technology exists to really give you a, a really scientific way to do it. Um, we are firmly convinced, and I know it's been covered a lot here, that the, the PIs and directors really have to lead the mentors um, in the process because the mentors don't understand it. Um, and we have really adopted a broad definition of diversity in as many ways as we possibly can. But of course, after Chris's talk yesterday, we have e even more ways to think about diversity. So you know, this is a great workshop to learn this kind of stuff. Um, I'll also say one other thing. Um, I think the reason that, that Luciano wanted us to talk about this 
Um, and this is very dangerous because I'm going to try to get into a program director's head, so Amanda, correct me immediately uh, when I get this wrong. But you know, when I think about writing an annual report, I kind of think about you know our, our program directors are scientists too, and you know they have questions that they're trying to answer, and they have goals that they're trying to achieve. And each of our projects is a little experiment on how do we try to answer those questions and meet those goals. And they need data. And you know, right now, this is an experiment. Can we actually move the needle in terms of inclusion and access and reaching out to two-year co community college students and get them engaged? That's what all of this is about. And they need data to understand, is this being effective? And, and that's what we're trying to do, is to sort of show them, yeah, we're, we're getting the message, and, and here's how we're doing it, and here's our process. And, and, and we're not getting everything right. We've got a lot of lessons to learn, but, but this, is, this is how things are being affected. So one, th one thing I see that's missing from this is the engagement of the mentors. So in my program, I really try to match the students with potential mentors, because I think that's really been key to uh, the success of my program. So I don't see that at all in your selection process. Uh, like we said, we, we did have them involved in the scoring um, at the later phases. Yes, they were as many of them who would volunteer, which we couldn't get everybody on board with that. Um, but, but it's also, well, we were careful not to do that too far. In our particular theme, we are, we are wanting our group to work as a group. And so we didn't want to have everybody silo out too early. We were actually experimenting with the perfect timing of that. And we waited until um, really probably the first week of the program before it was really clear who people were matched up with, although there was plenty of strong hints of how that was going to go. Yeah. We, and, and that's part of the, the interdisciplinary theme of it. We actually made sure that every one of our eight students did <laughs> tasks with every project that was in in the, 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 the REU, so they all used every instrument. And the idea was that we want an engineer to work with a forester and to understand how these things are interrelated. We want a geologist to work with a policy person to understand how these things are interrelated. So I was just wondering about your um, reasoning for Qualtrics. You know, um, you're talking about technology and there's uh, several platforms that can be used to, what made you choose that? And what other platforms did you consider? Um, I used it because uh, it was free for us. <laughs> Our institution already has a subscription, so there was no additional cost. Um, and I, I've used it for several other applications. Um, so I have an administrative post within my department. And so we do student surveys all the time, like, hey, uh, if we offered this course in the spring, how many of you would take it? And we send that out to all the juniors and things like that. So I, it was just an, an issue of no marginal cost and, and experience with using it. But you're absolutely right. You know, I, This is not a commercial for Qualtrics. Uh, but it is a commercial for using good technology. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I have a question. When you try to reach out to encourage those students to apply, especially underrepresented directly, so does that cause some bitter sour feeling when you actually directly ask them to apply but, but end up not selecting them? Or their mentor, or their mentors. So, is there a middle way to do that? You want to take that one? No. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I understand your question. What, could you repeat that? Yeah, I, I just say uh, there are two sides, right? The um, the institute running the RU program and the underrepresented students. So, I can go out, reach out to directly encourage them to apply, those students to apply. But uh, I, I, if I do that, but then the students do send in the application, but I don't end up selecting them. It's it's natural. I cannot select ever from right. Does that cause some bitter sour uh, we feeling? We do two things. One is when we send the um, the students their reject letter, we word it very carefully so that they know that we that there were so many ap great applications and and this was a very tough decision for us and wishing them well. So we were very careful to word that um, reject email so that they understand a little bit more about how hard it is actually to be selected, but, but how proud they should be, you know, at the same time of, of their being in the process. Um, I guess the other aspect is, is that when we reached out to them, we weren't giving them any indication that they were going to be shortlisted, <laughs> just that, that we were very interested in hearing more from them. I mean, I, I, you have to be careful how you word those things. Yeah. Yes. Oh, there's one back there. 
Um, of the, so two questions, one for you guys specifically, one for the group. Um, of the applications that weren't completed, uh, did you find out why they were never completed? You know, was it because of the, the travel or anxiety or complexity of the program? And the second question for the group is, um, you said you had 101 applicants? 110. 110. Um, and our site had 99 applications completed. And I'm just curious, is that like a common number, about 100 across all the sites? And maybe uh, so. the program managers will speak to that later. How many later. people get less than 100? How many get less than 100? But there's some that get 250. So, or 300. Um, so I'm more of a comment, really, but I, I just wanted to say thank you for highlighting something like Qualtrics as um, a useful tool. Um, I'm a social scientist, I'm an educational researcher, uh, and an evaluation specialist. Um, and we get under underutilized <laughs> on our campuses, to be perfectly honest. Um, a number of us are, you know, survey developers. We have a lot of experience in putting together things like this, and everything from questioning strategies to then how to report out. Um, and these type of tools are very, very useful and often already readily available on your campus and free to use. They're part of your university systems. Um, Qualtrics has actually become one of the most popular survey tools that universities use at the moment. It's, it's hot stuff. Um, mostly because it's extremely powerful on the analytical end. I switched from SurveyMonkey a long time ago when I was very first an ed researcher to Qualtrics for that reason. I'm not. I don't work for Coltrix. <laughs> <laughs> but those of you who are social scientists in the room as well, I'm, I'm sure you can agree. We, we do have a lot of collective experience. We're right there. Um, please do use us. So, so thank you. And for demonstrating you know, the power of reporting and how useful it can be in terms of program planning. Yeah, I just want to make a comment because we did ask them to, I didn't realize, get thrown to the wolves on this. <laughs> um, I mean, part of the reason was when we see your annual reports, we see who your participants were. And then because of the spreadsheet, we you tell us how many applicants you had. But we rarely know anything about what that initial pool looked like and how that related to what the final pool was and how people are going about trying to make decisions along the way that's that's objective and fair but is also working towards the goals of the site and and I also want to say in regards to the diversity um, you know, I over the last two days, everyone here is clearly committed to that. But you know, with REU sites being small numbers, if you have eight students, if it was going to be perfectly diverse, then every student would be the only one, right? In which, and there's a certain amount of like feeling like you're with other people um, like you in the experience, and also every site doesn't have to reach every underrepresented group. I, I challenge you to think about how your particular site and what, where you're situated and what relationships you have where you can really make a contribution. So I don't expect every site to have perfectly diverse. I expect you all to, in the area, you can make the most contribution to really put your efforts there. And clearly this was a site that was trying really hard to get two-year students. And you can see through their process that they actually ended up with more two-year students than you would have thought by their initial applicant pool. So that's why we wanted them to um, present on this, um, just to give you guys kind of some insight into ways to go about it. Nice summary. I think we only can take one more question because we're, we're running over time. Claire? Uh, thank you for presenting this. Um, is this on? No. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, it was based on the discussion about the two African-American students you decided not to take. Um, one thing I guess I wanted to just throw out there for to keep in your mind during the selection process um, is the concept of your own implicit biases and what 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 it means to be enthusiastic to you versus to somebody else of perhaps a different culture and um, not everybody will reflect what we think is enthusiastic. Some people will be jumping up and down, be super giddy. Other people might be very calm and collected and serious, but that 
to in in every aspect of the recruitment process that um, our our own biases are going to be front and center, and just just to keep them in check, to to know that they they exist and they're real, and everybody has them, and to try not let them interfere with your decision making process as far as humanly possible. And and that's really I'm going to take that as being directed to all of us, right? And not just our poor speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so we're, we're running out the, of time. The subtitle of this is Making Sausage. You know how to do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>